Okay, everybody. So, uh, welcome to uh, the first uh, global SPH uh, seminar uh, being run by uh, uh, Spheric. Um, this is a new initiative, so I'm just going to uh, say a few words and um, um, just to, to say where all this came from. So, just a quick reminder what is Spheric. So, Spheric is the uh, international SPH organization, and uh, we do a lot of um, uh, activities to try and encourage the, the development and the uptake of, of, of Spheric. And, and these aims are, are on the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Spheric website, and, and you can see here that we do everything from developing the fundamental basis of SPH through to identifying the, the future needs and and developing uh, benchmark test cases. So that's what we do and we try to bring people together as much as possible. Normally we would have a lot of activities that we do uh, and one of those would be um, an annual three-day workshop but we've been denied that this year because of the disruption due to COVID-19 and we all missed the opportunity to share our research and discuss new ideas and, and grow uh, friendships. However, during all this disruption, where many of us are working from home, it's very important that we continue to discuss the, discuss the latest SPH developments and ideas. And um, the idea for these seminars um, was sort of inspired by similar um, activities going on around the world as we all adapted to the, the, the new reality. So uh, the Spheric uh, Steering Committee decided to um, organize um, a set of seminars to try and reach everybody, no matter where you are in, in, in the world. So uh, we set up a small committee, so myself, Nathan Quinlan and Angelo Tafuni. Um, we've spent a few months trying to pull this all together and um, we've been very lucky that, to identify some excellent speakers who are going to present during the, the next few months. So we're going to have a, a monthly uh, uh, seminar uh, on this. So. Um, that's that's our plan. So during today, okay, I'm sure many of you are very very familiar with Zoom, but um, we would ask you to sort of turn off your camera and mute mute your microphone during the the presentation. This is to save bandwidth and to allow Daniel to do a great uh, talk. Um, and then during the, the question and answer session, uh, you can either click the blue hand um, uh, in the participant list, or you can post your question in the chat or if you're particularly vocal, you can unmute and ask your question at, at the end. So that's what we'll be doing. These seminars are recorded. So uh, if, you, if you don't want to uh, uh, be on the recording, that's why you should uh, turn off your camera, uh, etc. Okay, so um, we're going to start. I just want to say a very big thank you to Professor Daniel Price for agreeing to kick off this brand new seminar series. It's quite a brave thing to do. Uh, and, uh, well, have a very pleasant and interesting seminar. I'm now going to hand over to Angelo Tafuni, who's going to chair uh, the, the seminar today. Thank you, Ben. Um, can you all hear me well? Yes. So. Okay. Um, yes, just uh, would like to introduce our speaker, who once again we want to thank uh, deeply. Uh, many of you know him already. Um, uh, he's a uh, professor, Dr. Daniel Price is a professor in the School of Astro in Physics and Astronomy at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Prior to this, he was a Royal Society University Research Fellow at the University of Exeter, before which he also had a PPARC STFC Postdoctoral Research Fellowship at Exeter. He completed his PhD at the Institute of Astronomy at the University of Cambridge. His research interests are broadly in computational astrophysics, generally involving star and planet formation, accretion disks, and the smoothed particle aerodynamics uh, method, of course. Uh, today is going to deliver a talk titled uh, Smoothed Particle Aerodynamics, a Developer's Guide. Um, personally, I can't wait for it. So, Daniel, the floor is yours. Um, I'm going to mute myself. Thank you. Thanks, Angelo. And uh, it's, I just want to say thanks again to the organizers. It's a very great honor to open this series. So I'm obviously delighted to be here. And I hope I can do justice to it and set a good tone. And um, I'm also want to apologize that, you know, I was thinking about what would be interesting to present here. 
And I'm very aware that there's many other areas of SPH development that go on that I'm not gonna cover at all today. My hope of course, is that the rest of the series will cover those aspects. Um, so I'm really gonna give you a personal view. Um, so it's not meant to be representative of um, everything that's been done over the years, but really sort of a personal recollection about the sort of hard thought about lessons that I've learned over the years. And hopefully there's something useful in that for you. So I'm not gonna try and give an unbiased review and I apologize if I don't cover your work. Uh, so just, this is nothing more than my own meandering experience. So I'm gonna start with a basic problem. And a lot of people have, you know, kind of thought about this, but uh, you know, in conversations with people, often um, I find some confusion arises when you try to think about things as particles. So we wanna discretize some equations onto a set of particles that we say we have some mass and we wanna move these particles with the velocity of the fluid. Now that sort of concept is simple enough, but it's then what do we do next? Okay, we've got that basic concept. We've got some particles, we want them to move like Lagrangian particles. How do we go about discretizing, you know, solving the equations that we wanna solve? There's a lot of sort of misconceptions about how you might do this. Um, perhaps if you wanna make me not co-host so you don't get those notifications on the screen. Maybe you guys do that. All right, so, so this is the problem I wanna think about is so we've got a set of partial differential equations, for example, equations of fluid dynamics. You know, how do we go about discretizing them onto a set of particles? And I'm gonna cover some very simple things. Actually, I've made a lot of mileage in my career from just very um, simple ideas with sort of wider applications. And some of my most high impact things have been actually kind of in some ways the dumbest things just very simple um, ideas carried um, into different areas. So I wanna try and cover the basics of that in a series of lessons. So my lessons on how I've gone about doing this with various bits of physics over the years. So the lesson one and why I drew a picture of a bridge here is really the fundamental thing for me is this density sum we have in SPH. For me, that's the bridge. What do I mean by a bridge? It's the bridge between the discrete and the continuum. So the continuum is this continuum, we're trying to think about fluids, they're a continuous thing. Discrete means we're representing on a set of particles. So, so for me, this is really the sort of axiom on which you build something like SPH. And of course, this goes back to the earliest papers. So what do we mean by this? We mean we've got this set of particles that have a mass, but I'm asking the question, what's the density? Now there's many ways of answering this question. What's the density of this set of particles? You could draw a grid, you could draw a mesh, all kinds of things. But in SPH, the answer to that is to do something meshless. Uh, and so our bridge takes the form of this density summation. And of course, you're hopefully all familiar with this if you've done anything in SPH. With the basic density summation is how I convert my discrete particles with a mass into a continuous field, namely the density field, which I can define anywhere in space. So I'm just gonna take you through some simple examples and actually some new ideas that I've been having in the last you know, few months while I've been locked in my house about where these simple principles take us. So what can we do with, once we've written down the basic SPH density sum, how is that useful as a bridge? So here's a really simple example. Um, which was not obvious at the time, but it's got to become obvious now, um, namely how you do SPH visualization. So for a long time in astronomy, people used to just make particle plots. So um, you would plot the particles and then color them by some quantity. But of course we know how to convert any quantity on particles into a continuous field. So if we're trying to do visualization and you can see the picture behind me, for example, um, it's a fluid. It looks like a fluid. It doesn't look like a set of particles. And so when we're visualizing SPH simulations, the natural way to do that is to use this interpolation that we've been given by that density summation to visualize our set of particles as a fluid. So this bridge is the density summation again. And it's a really simple thing but it takes us from thinking about discrete particles to thinking about uh, continuum. Sorry, that's meant to be a movie, but here's another example. So that density summation, again, if what we want is a 3D visualization, for example, 
Here's a simulation of a star being shredded by a black hole uh, from just last year. And we want to visualize the column density. So we want to visualize the density field integrated along the line of sight. And so we can just take our density summation, integrate it through the z direction, and basically splat the particles as kind of a sort of fuzzy sphere in two dimensions. But that's mathematically well defined. And so we can get a visualization of our column density, in this case, from a tidal disruption event simulation, um, without, with just basically riffing on that density summation idea. Now you might thinking this is pretty simple stuff. And yes, it is, but if you, you know, the more um, I've, I've gone over the years, the more this sort of sinks deeper inside me and it comes out in, in other ways. So one of the things we've done in astronomy for a long time is this idea of having adaptive resolution lengths. So um, for example, you have particles which are often clustered in high density regions and some lower density regions. And so obviously those have different, um, well, they have different resolving power in terms of how many particles you have, if you think about a fixed number of neighbors, for example. And so what we usually do is we take a smoothing length, which is inversely proportional to the density. And so that's, uh, again, just playing on this idea of this density sum as this bridge. It's a much better way of defining the continuous field. So we've got, again, this bridge now is a bit more sophisticated. Um, and to solve these equations, it's a simultaneous set of equations where we solve the smoothing length and the density simultaneously. Now, because you see my sum here, my density involves my smoothing length, my smoothing length involves my density. So this is an iterative procedure. It's a simultaneous equation for smoothing length and density. And we have to solve it iteratively, but we can solve that to arbitrary precision and it's pretty cheap to do. And we do it in um, most of our astro codes. But for example, we can riff on this idea. So, okay, so where else is an adaptive smoothing length um, sort of density estimate useful? So one simple example is gravitational forces. So you often think about calculating gravitational forces on a set of particles. Now, if those particles are not meant to be real things, like they're not one particle per star, they're meant to be 10 to the four stars, for example, then a formula like this, where you just sum over the, you know, the other n bodies in your system, um, and you know, do GMM on R squared is actually not the correct formula. It's, it's a sort of approximation where you treat every particle as a delta function. So it's thinking about that discrete element that I've been talking about. Whereas what we wanna do is build a bridge from the discrete to the continuum. So what do I mean by that? Well, what we're really trying to do in a lot of these situations, for example, self-gravitating gas dynamics, um, you know, N body simulations where you've got a continuous fluid, is we're trying to think about the continuum. So that's thinking about solving Poisson's equation, the field equation for the gravitational field. And we're thinking about the density field as a continuous field. So hopefully you're with me on where I'm going with this. You know, we know how to define a continuous density field in SPH. That's called using this bridge. So we have this wonderful bridge, the density summation, and we should use it. And so when you do that, you know, you can work it all through and you can find, you know, a really nice way of doing what you call gravitational force softening, which is the technical name for this. But basically, you know, a force that doesn't diverge when the particles kind of come on top of each other, whether those particles are stars or SPH particles, they're not really real. And I'm going to come back to that. Just another example, I'm just going to riff on this for a bit. Here's a crazy idea um, that, that just came actually from some collaborations I was involved in. What about using SPH interpolation for image interpolation? Of course, um, kernel methods are well known in doing image interpolation. So you can think about a sort of pixelized image as like a set of SPH particles. You might think I've been locked down for too long, but it's gonna get worse. Um, and in particular, one of the issues in faint astronomical imaging is that the noise is proportional to the intensity. But you know, it kind of annoys me when I see astronomy images and they're all sort of pixelated like this because I think, well, you know, you should just interpolate um, and produce, you know, you don't need pixels this big. We, we should get the underlying continuous field. So all you can do is simply pretend that the pixels are SPH particles. So that's so the, this pixelated image is like a discrete thing, like an, I've got a set of particles. And again, I can build a bridge 
like the density summation that takes me from that to the continuum. So the most basic way of doing that is just, you know, kernel, um, you know, every time you do an image rotation uh, with some Python package, that's basically what's done for you is, you know, basically doing sub pixel interpolation. But now let's riff on this idea again. Um, what if we can use an adaptive smoothing length? And so the problem I was particularly interested in here was like removing noise um, from an astronomy image of the sky. So the sky is faint. You often get a lot of sort of plus on noise, which is proportional to intensity. Um, but what if we, instead of using a constant like convolution length here or the smoothing length, what if we again use this kind of density summation that we have in SVH and do uh, adaptive resolution lengths? So let's make the smoothing length inversely proportional to the intensity to the square root. Uh, and indeed, you can do a very good job of getting rid of your noise this way. So you can download the package and have a look if you like. But it turns out this actually works really well. So here's, an, here's a real life example. Um, here's the image on the left is the original image taken from um, the sphere, uh, the very large telescope. We're very creative in astronomy by naming telescopes. So it's called the VLT, it's a very large telescope. And on the right, uh, you can see this kind of SPH density sum interpolated uh, real image. This is not a simulation. This is just an image of the night sky. Uh, this is a star and it's got some material around it. And what this reveals when you remove all this noise um, and get the underlying continuum image is you can see these wonderful spiral arms that really tell the story here about what's happening to this protoplanetary disk. Namely, another star is smashed into it and um, spun off these spiral arms. So um, just some examples of what you can do in an SPH summation. And I've been locked down long enough um, that uh, I really have started seeing SPH particles everywhere. So just another example, I'm also involved in some radio, well, sort of millimeter wavelength astronomy with the ALMA telescope in Chile. And when you observe the sky with interferometers, you get a sort of series of, um, so that basically there's some antennas and they kind of move as the earth rotates and that sort of forms this track which is basically a track in you know distance but you know it records basically the the radio signal from the sky um, on this kind of track uh, which is well sort of measured in like you know meters or kilometers um, but converting this into an image is actually quite a difficult process so for example you know this is basically a a Fourier transform of the image. So image reconstruction in radio astronomy usually involves some quite complicated procedure um, where you have to do what's called deconvolution to make this look like a real image of the sky. And so that's the typical image. Um, well, this is a particular image in a particular channel of, a, again, a protoplanetary disk, which is something I happen to work on. Here, we're actually looking for baby planets here. But I thought, again, you know, I've got a set of points here what if I pretend that they're SPH particles? And so a natural way to do this um, is to simply interpolate these dots in this plane called the UV plane. It's basically the Fourier transform plane of the image. Um, what if I just do my adaptive smoothing length interpolation in this plane and you get a nice um, smooth continuum image, which is what we're talking about here. And indeed, this actually works really well. So if you inverse Fourier transform that, you actually get a much nicer image than what you get out of pretty standard radio astronomy software. So this is all just a sort of play on the same point that this very basic SPH axiom about how you reconstruct a continuous thing from a discrete thing actually has lots and lots of like really simple but really powerful um, applications. So, you know, you might think the density sum is just this thing that you sort of think about and throw away, but if you think about it really deeply, there's a lot of um, interesting things to do here. And the second reason it's useful is because, you know, it's the, it's the feed into deriving the rest of the basic SPH algorithm. So if you've um, followed me long, long enough, you know that I love Lagrangians, but lesson two for me is, you know, over the years is to really, it's, found that it's really, really helpful to think about the Lagrangian. So I'm not actively monitoring the chat here, but if you um, feel free to dive in if you want to during the talk, um, particularly in the chat, and I'll respond if we have time. So what do I mean by using the Lagrangian? Well, is this pretty standard procedure in SPH from, for deriving the equations of motion. 
And this gives you the way of discretizing your fluid equations. So we're going back to that original problem. How do I discretize a set of equations? Well, with this Lagrangian technique, we have this very powerful toolkit where we can simply write down the Lagrangian. So for example, we can simply write down the kinetic energy minus the thermal energy or the internal energy of the fluid. And then the, the rest is basically pretty standard machinery. So you write down the Lagrangian, you write down the first law of thermodynamics, which obviously implies here no entropy change. And we'll come back to that. You use this bridge that we've built. So this density summation that takes us from the, the discrete to the continuum and back again. But here we're just using the discrete directly. We've written down Lagrangian, we've got a mass, velocities, we've got a density summation. And sticking that into the Euler-Lagrange equations just gives us the discretized equations of motion, which turn out to be, um, but kind of a rather surprising form of them, but they turn out to be the usual fluid equations. Now, hopefully everyone knows and loves this already. But again, this is just, you know, a really simple thing that can be really powerful if you think about the other ways of, you know, if you use this in different applications. So for example, last year, um, or the last few years, I've had a student and we've been developing an algorithm for general relativistic smooth particle hydrodynamics. So what's different in relativity? Well, you know, and you might think about lots of things about, you know, the can't go faster than the speed of light and, you know, Einstein's equations instead of Newtonian gravity and all this sort of stuff. But really mathematically, all you need to do is write down the Lagrangian. So the Lagrangian is just a bit more complicated, involves a few tensors, but really the mechanics of it are the same. First law of thermodynamics, density gradient, um, or Lagrange equations. And you just run the same machinery and what you get out is your general relativistic, you know, equations of motion. And indeed, they are just the fluid equations um, in, a, in a much sort of more powerful and, and you know, kind of, um, well, they're, they're fully relativistic now. So we have this conserved density instead of, so sorry, this should be a rho star here. It's the only difference. Um, but in particular, the momentum is no longer the velocity in relativity. So for example, in special relativity, you would have a Lorentz factor times the velocity um, equal to is the specific momentum. So we can see already that our equations are in this kind of form where we've got a d momentum dt on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, it looks like our usual SVH equations just with a little few little funny notations like the square root of minus g, which is the kind of volume element. But basically we've used the same machinery and we, what we get out of that is equations of motion which satisfy our conservation laws. Just another example, what if we want to you know, simulate magnetic fields on particles? This is something I've worked on a lot over the years. Again, you can just extend your Lagrangian a little bit, add a little bit of physics, namely the magnetic energy, as well as your internal energy and your um, kinetic energy. It's a little bit different how you stick it through the Lagrangian, namely because you need an extra constraint from the way that the magnetic field perturbation evolves. But basically it's the same machinery. You can again, get out your equations of motion for the magnetic, um, for a gas in the presence of a magnetic field. So the Lagrangian really kind of tells you how to go about getting your equations of motion given your basic assumptions. And your basic assumption is really that density summation, how you go from the particles to a continuous um, fluid. So I hope that's pretty clear. There's some caveats, but basically lesson two for me um, is you know, what the Lagrangian gives us it is all comes from Emmy Nutter, um, who is one of the most wonderful mathematicians and some really nice uh, YouTube videos if you don't know Nutter's theorem. But basically Nutter's theorem tells us that symmetries in the Lagrangian give us conservation laws. So for example, translational symmetry gives us conservation of momentum. Um, time symmetry gives us conservation of energy. Rotational symmetry gives us conservation of angular momentum. And so because our SPH Lagrangian and our, in particular our SPH density estimate satisfies all those symmetries, it's not time dependent. It doesn't matter if you move the particles, you're gonna get the same density. If you rotate the particles, you know, you, if you rotate your kernel, you're gonna get the same density estimate. Therefore we satisfy conservation of momentum, conservation of angular momentum, conservation of energy. Um, so, that's, so that's what the Lagrangian gives us. Now there's some caveats to this. But there's also some like not obvious um, implications. 
And in particular, the Lagrangian tells you a particular way of doing things which guarantees that you satisfy the conservation laws, but it doesn't guarantee other things. So for example, it doesn't guarantee that your pressure gradient vanishes when the pressure is constant. And this is kind of important in a really not obvious way, um, but it basically comes down to guaranteeing that there exists a minimum energy state. And that is really important for SPH as a particle method. Um, and it goes back to the really early work by, for example, Gingold and Monaghan, we're really expecting SPH to be a, like a Monte Carlo method. So they were really expecting sort of root n neighbor um, sort of errors. And they were very surprised to find that, you know, they actually had much better error um, properties than that. And that's simply that if you chuck down a bunch of particles with, that are completely random um, in a uniform density, you know, sort of uniform pressure uh, box, then if you put them in a bad arrangement, the SPH particles kind of feel each other because there is a small error you know, in this, um, the way that you discretize the pressure gradient. And therefore, you know, they, they kind of feel each other and feel a kind of mutual exclusion, which guarantees that they arrange themselves in a regular way, which guarantees that the thing on the right-hand side of this equation vanishes. And so this, this is a kind of non-obvious consequence of the Lagrangian, which is basically that SPH particles know how to stay regular. So it's, SPH is not at all a Monte Carlo method. And that's because the particles, um, do uh, the positions are correlated with each other. And this is kind of from enforcing conservation. Um, so for example, simple example of this, which I talk about in the 2012 paper is, you know, if you try to think about better ways of getting a gradient, for example, just take a, a difference in the pressures here, which is also a valid discretization of the pressure gradient. Then what you find is the particles have no minimum energy state. You violate the conservation of momentum. And therefore, you know, this kind of random particle distribution will never get sorted out, which means, you know, lots of particle methods are built on this kind of idea where you want consistency and you want linear errors done perfectly. Uh, but if you give up on conservation, you give up on this kind of global constraint on the particle distribution, namely that, you know, particles always know how to sort themselves out into some kind of locally regular uh, distribution. And even attempts you know, to try and do both, for example, with a Voronoi particle scheme where you can try and get the pressure gradient to vanish when the pressure is constant. Again, you end up in the same problem. The particles become disordered. And once the particles are disordered, no matter how good your method is, um, you know, you're, you're basically back to Monte Carlo and that's the worst case scenario. So really you know, having some way of sorting the particles out turns out to be quite fundamental to the way SPH works in practice. You know, you know, and if you give up on that, you're in trouble and you end up having to invent these kind of manual reordering schemes for particles, which turn out to get very, really complicated. So, you know, the, the kind of weird thing that happens is that you try to improve the gradient, but you actually get worse results in your simulation. Um, and so what the Lagrangian taught us is to actually use a worse operator, but think about conservation as being more important. Or in other words, trust the Lagrangian. I apologize for bringing Donald into this, but it seemed timely. Um, but in all caps, um, you know, conservation reigns supreme. Although you might dispute this claim about conservation. So I'm gonna come back to that in a second. Now, the third lesson for me is that, you know, how do you know when your SPH simulation has gone wrong? One of the things that we talk about a lot in astrophysics is, you know, that SPH simulations don't crash. Uh, and they don't crash, and I'm going to come back to this about um, entropy, but basically if you've satisfied the conservation laws and you guarantee that you're, you know, you satisfy the, the laws of thermodynamics, then your simulation turns out to be really, really stable. Um, so if you screw something up, how do you know that you've screwed it up? And the answer is the sort of freedom left in SPH is in the particle distribution. So, you know, if we want to dispute this claim about conservation, I'll give you some examples where conservation does go wrong. One example is with, with magnetic fields. So with magnetic fields, we have this gradient of a stress tensor, but of course the stress tensor in, in uh, MHD, magnetohydrodynamics, can be negative. So um, there's, a, there's a tension force. So um, magnetic field lines give you a tension perpendicular to the field line. So this SIJ can under some circumstances give you a negative pressure. And a negative pressure of course means particles attract each other. Um, and so particles attracting each other is catastrophic. Um, 
And what you do to fix that usually is just give up on a little bit of that conservation and go back to sort of slightly more accurate gradient estimates. Um, but another, here's a, like an example from a while ago, but it's just to show you that the thing on the left actually conserves um, momentum and energy better than the thing on the right. So, you know, if you're monitoring your conservation laws, everything's actually more perfect in the one on the left here. Um, but, you know, the, the, the tensile instability, which is this negative pressure issue, has caused it to go horribly wrong. But the way that you really see it going horribly wrong is because the particles have become incredibly noisy. So a really good heuristic for an SPH particle, you know, SPH simulation doing something wrong, uh, in my experience is, you know, is that your particle distribution looks noisy. And I kind of learned this, you know, um, that it's, it's an interesting thing because you would often look at that and say, oh, the method's rubbish and, you know, that doesn't work. Um, but really it's an indication that you're a bit rubbish um, and that you should have done something better in the way that you're discretizing your equations or there's something you haven't thought about, for example, in this case, this tensile instability issue. So, you know, whereas, you know, um, sort of finite volume codes would just crash because they get a ne negative pressure or something goes horribly wrong, um, SBH tends to manifest that as noise in the particle distribution. All right, um, so errors go into the particle distribution. So my lesson four over the years is really this thing about entropy. Now I learned this from Joe Monaghan pretty early on, but basically if you're deriving an SPH algorithm, one of the best ways to make sure it's stable is just that entropy goes up. And I'm gonna give you a few examples of this. For example, shock capturing is the, the original and best. So the whole point about the Lagrangian is it implies that you have a dissipation loss system. Now, obviously the, the equations of fluid dynamics are this kind of tricky beast where you start out with a system with zero dissipation in your equations. You don't have any, if you're not writing the Navier-Stokes equations, then there's no viscous terms. So just the Euler equations, they don't have any dissipation in them, but you find that you get these solutions that imply steepening. So a, a wave with some reasonable amplitude compared to the speed of sound will become steeper and form a shock. And when you solve the equations of conservation across the jump, then you, you notice that the entropy increases. So you have this irreversible dissipation, even though your equations are notionally reversible. Of course, they're not, they're not reversible in practice. And that's because this assumption that you don't allow the shock to become the, the fluid to become fluid velocity become double valued. And that implies dissipation, even though you haven't actually put any into your equations. But in the numerical scheme, that means of course, we need some dissipation to lead us to this entropy increase. And we do that usually in SPH with formulating artificial dissipation terms. So for example, you know, in the terms formulated by, you know, Joe Monaghan back in the day, um, you involve these sort of jumps in the conserved variables, for example, in the total energy and in the um, specific momentum. And you can simply go through and prove that, you know, these terms, um, the, the entropy according to the first law of thermodynamics, so TDSDT is the UDT minus PDV work. Um, and you can put your SPH discretization of these into the relevant formula. And you can prove, for example, that for the artificial viscosity term, you get a positive definite um, contribution to the heat. And doing something like that means that you guarantee that your entropy is positive definite and therefore you can have the required dissipation to resolve this kind of steepening of a wave without giving you this kind of numerical. Now, this is not an instability. This is just, um, this is just the particles trying to make heat, but without having a way of converting kinetic energy into heat. So second example of this, um, you know, we we're thinking uh, recently about how to, how to implement non-ideal magnetohydrodynamics. So that's magnetic fields um, on particles. But where you have three different um, kinds of, of fluid, so you have ions, electrons, and neutrals. And the usual way you do that is with the kind of mixture model. And in particular, you know, you write down the evolution equation for the magnetic field. It has this particular form. Um, when you make some approximations about, for example, the electrons having negligible mass, you end up with these three terms in your equation for you know, the magnetic field evolution, which is called the induction equation. These give you, for example, the effects are known as ohmic resistivity, the Hall effect, which is ion electron drift, 
and you get ion neutral drift, which gives you something that in astrophysics we call ambipolar diffusion, um, but it's called different things in plasma physics, but basically the drift between the ions and the neutrals. So you might think, well, how do I discretize something like this into SPH? These are kind of dissipative terms so they don't pop out of your Lagrangian. And the answer is basically, you know, obey thermodynamics at all costs. So the simple thing is, you know, we've got a curl of something on the right hand side. And that, that thing is um, J is the magnetic current, it's the curl of the magnetic field. So we can write down, for example, um, our sort of favorite SPH curl operator for finding the, the magnetic current. But that kind of tells us if we want to obey thermodynamics, what, how I must discretize this term here with the, with the curl of D. So basically the thing I want to guarantee is that my, you know, any heat production is positive, which is the same thing as saying the entropy um, increases. And if I do that, then my method's going to be stable. And indeed this method turns out to be, you know, excellent and, you know, We've used it widely for simulating magnetic fields in star formation. So on the left, for example, is a series of calculations, just a really simple sort of toy calculation where you take a rotating sphere collapsing under its own gravity and it's rotating, but there's a magnetic field in the thing. Um, and some of these dissipation effects, so where we get this really nice jet of material launched um, with what you call ideal magnetohydrodynamics, so perfectly conducting fluid. When you have these partial conductivity effects, you know, you can take away some of this launching of this outflow um, and get something more like a wide angled wind instead. Um, lots of these, you know, but again, the principle here is what I want to get across. It's that, you know, this entropy must increase is the sort of guiding principle here if you want to formulate dissipative terms uh, in SPH. Another example, just uh, something we worked on last year about uh, if you want to do anisotropic diffusion. So for example, heat diffusion, um, isotropic diffusion is pretty straightforward. You know, if I just want heat diffusing out of my body, for example, then you know, we've known how to do that for a long time. But anisotropic diffusion, for example, if you, so this heat equation here, but I have this kappa, this diffusion constant is a, is a tensor rather than a scalar or a matrix. Um, then the diffusion can operate in a particular direction. So that's what I'm showing on the right here. So I've just defined a direction here, which is, uh, or Sergei defined a direction, which is, you know, the, I want uh, heat diffusion only to occur in the X direction, for example. So the exact solution is the top row, you know, and a couple of different uh, SPH methods we were playing around with. So this espanol Venga approach for doing direct second derivatives um, actually turns out to be unstable for this problem. And that's simply, you can show that in terms of just whether or not the entropy increases. So guaranteeing that the entropy increases means that your method will be stable. And for anisotropic diffusion, that's kind of a tricky business, but you can prove that this is true. For example, if you do similar to what we just showed you for the non-ideal MHD, if you take two first derivatives and you're careful about your operators, you can guarantee stability. All right, so, and if your obviously your entropy is not guaranteed to increase, you can uh, very commonly have instabilities. So lesson five um, is that particles are not real. And I wanna get this one across because it's a very common one um, in conversations in astronomy in particular. So the conversation will go something like this. Oh, so I've been thinking about how to simulate magnetic fields in SPH. And okay, so I've got a bunch of particles um, so, you know, I want to think about how to turn them into like magnetized particles. So you think, well, I'll give them like my mass and my velocity and I want to give them like a magnetic field. So does that mean I should like make my particles into little magnetic dipoles that move around and somehow make them interact and stuff like that? Um, and the conversation kind of goes like that for a while and you sort of think, well, we're going in a sort of funny direction here of like thinking of particles as real things. And really for me, one of the big lessons of SPH is never to think about particles as real things. And I'll give you a couple of examples of this. Um, instead, what we should do is think about how we've got this set of equations we want to discretize and we want to think about the continuum. We want to think about this bridge between the continuum and the discrete. And so we want to think about a set of partial differential equations. We want to use our Lagrangian. I mean, we've already kind of covered this for magnetic fields, how you would go about doing this in SPH. And so, you know, for example, this is how we do smooth particle hydrodynamics. We use the Lagrangian, we obtain our discretized MHD equations, which I've already written down for you. 
And so the best way to think about that is in terms of, you know, solving partial differential equations, you know, discretized with the Lagrangian. And so, you know, you can make it look afterwards like your particles have got little magnetic fields on them. But of course the particles are not real. They're just interpolation points in the flow. And if you start thinking about particles as real, I find often it just ends up in a bad place. So for example, you know, what, we, what the Lagrangian gave us is a way of turning our partial differential equations into discretized you know, equations as sums over neighbors on the right hand side. And we don't have to think about the particles as being anything more than just interpolation points. They're just interpolation points in the flow. So particles are not real. This is totally fake news. I'm hoping I'm getting like zoom laughter here. So I don't, I don't know if I'm getting any funnies at all from the audience, but um, you have to tell me afterwards. Thanks, Ben. So just an, another sort of example from astronomy, a bit of a famous one. So I'm sorry if I insult anyone here, but you know, this one has run for years in astronomy, this issue about Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities in SVH. Um, and, you know, it started with this, paper which is kind of provocative in the first place about fundamental differences between SPH and grid methods and you know and for me it started down the sort of fallacy again of like trying to think of particles as real things so for example here's this figure it says you know we're looking at the close-up of the SPH particles at the boundaries and we're closer in zoom and we can see what the problem is is there's like gaps between the particle distribution due to like improper density calculations and so the gap is so large that the fluids like don't interact properly and the something wrong with the particle. It just goes in a really weird direction quite quickly. Well, so for me, the way of understanding this, which was you know, quite a long time ago, which was don't look at particle plots is the first thing. So the right way to think about it, so I'm just, having said that, I'm now gonna show you a particle plot, um, but you know, to think about it in terms of just fluid behavior. So we're thinking about, um, actually the, the kind of thing here is that this issue which was raised related to Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities actually turned out to be nothing to do with Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities, just to do with how you treat discontinuities in the flow. So I mentioned before the Lagrangian gives you obviously a, a formulation that doesn't include dissipation. And so you need to formulate um, terms to be able to capture these discontinuous solutions, which in, imply dissipation. Um, so we apply artificial viscosity at a shock but artificial viscosity is not the whole story here. So if you follow those early papers from, um, for example, Joe Monaghan and some of his students, you know, you'll see that um, if you think about the way the dissipation occurs, it should be a jump in energy that gets dissipated. And that implies that each jump that's discontinuous should be treated by a different um, dissipation term. For example, in, in magnetic fields, uh, you have a jump in the magnetic field and that should be treated by uh, an artificial resistivity term, not just an artificial you know, viscosity. So the obvious thing that's not treated in a just, if you just apply viscosity is this, this other jump here, which is called the contact discontinuity. So we have a basically a sound wave traveling in each direction. This is a standard sod shock tube. I'm hoping people have seen this kind of thing before, but basically it's a one dimensional test problem. So the red line is the exact solution and the black dots of the particles. We've got a, a sort of sound wave traveling to the right here and, a, and another sound wave traveling to the left as a rarefaction. But where the fluids were initially in contact with each other, you get this sort of discontinuous jump in temperature, which is you here, the internal energy and density. Now the density is fine because that's done with the density summation. But the fact that this um, the UDT equation is a differential equation that doesn't have any dissipation in it, um, gives you this kind of blip in the pressure at the join. And of course, the right way to treat this is to use like same thing we do in kind of Riemann solvers or Godunov type schemes is you, every jump is treated by some kind of you know, dissipation term. And this is what was done of course by Joe Monaghan in 1997 is to make this analogy. And that came up with this idea of having, you know, uh, an artificial conductivity term. Um, and so basically the, point is here that this little blip in the pressure has been eliminated at the contact discontinuity. Now, how is this relevant to this original problem with the separation of gaps of particles? Because the original issue is here on the left. So if you try to simulate something like a Kelvin-Helmholtz instability, but you run it across a very sharp discontinuity, 
in density and temperature, but the pressure should be continuous, then you basically get a two-dimensional blip. And the two-dimensional blip in pressure just kind of looks like surface tension. But it's really, again, nothing really to do with the instability. It's to do with not having treated the discontinuous jump. And if you treat the discontinuous jump, then of course you get you know, very nice mixing across the interface. But it's really about treating the interface rather than you know, anything to do with instabilities itself. So, I mean, this one's run and run. Uh, you know, for me, I haven't you know, thought much more about it since. Um, it's sort of problem solved. I know that there's been a lot of issues since and people have gone with all sorts of random ideas. But for me, this conversation just ran in you know, a totally the wrong direction. And for some of that, started with this idea of thinking about particles as real. So particles are not real. And so my final lesson is, you know, that, um, you know, the lesson about particles not being real, this bridge between the discrete and the continuum is really that SPH is not that different from other numerical methods. So, um, yeah, we can make hats actually, perhaps we can make spherical hats. So, you know, for example, um, you know, one, uh, analogy we've already talked about a little bit is this idea of you know using like these Godinov type solvers uh, in SPH. So you know um, again the analogy was made quite a while ago. So a finite volume scheme, you know, you would sort of write this as a um, d conserved variable dt and a divergence of a flux. And so you know you would write that with some finite volume scheme. For example, you define a flux at the interface, and you have some you know way of writing down this flux, for example, the simplest one is this local lax friedrichs flux. But basically the first term here is the sort of dissipationless part and the second term is this sort of dissipation, which is very much like this artificial, you know, terms we add in SPH. In fact, you can make the analogy very directly about, you know, what, what sort of terms you should have here. So you, you notice that the, my F here is like my pressure. Um, you know, and we've got this extra term, which is like, you know, for any conserved variable, I should have a jump here on the right hand side treated with some sort of dissipation. And so this analogy actually turned out to be really helpful. Um, but it just goes to show really that the, the problems are really the same thing. So the sort of problems you solve with these methods in finite volume schemes are really the same issues that you have in SPH, namely that you know, you're discretizing a fluid, it's supposed to have, you know, it's supposed to turn into shocks, but you know, shocks are these discontinuous solutions which don't come into your differential equations. And so, for example, you can just import ideas from this and some stuff that I've been playing around with in the last couple of years, you know, is to use some of these Godinov methods in a simpler way um, in, you know, to improve basically the, the way, how much dissipation we get away from shocks. So, for example, one of the problems with artificial viscosity is, you know, as sort of originally formulated in SPH is it tends to be quite dissipative. It's just a first order term. Um, and if you're not careful about how it switches off. Um, so this is, for example, just a linear sound wave propagating, you know, in a periodic box in one dimension. And if you apply sort of standard artificial viscosity, you get a fair bit of dissipation after say 10 periods. But, you know, if you work out some of these schemes and you apply like reconstruction and these kind of methods that are used in finite volume schemes for minimizing dissipation, then those methods also work in SPH. Um, and so I've talked about this in the last couple of spheric conferences. Um, so a paper out this year, for example, uh, where one of the problems we had in simulating waves in a dust gas mixture, so a, a mixture of a fluid with some solid particles in it. Now that those sort of waves can damp. Um, but you know what we found was that when the drag force between the dust and the gas was very strong, we found that we had to use a lot of particles to, to really kill the dissipation of the wave. So that's what you see on the left here. So this is just a propagating wave. So the red line is the exact solution. And we've had to use like a thousand particles in one dimension to get this to you know, not dissipate like hell after a few periods, 10 periods. Uh, but again, with these kind of ideas, you know, using this sort of reconstructing the velocity jump to try to minimize, to try to basically stop the particles being at different locations to try and interpolate at a common location, which takes us back to the idea about thinking about the continuum, thinking about you know, applying dissipation at a single point rather than you know, having two particles separated in space. You know, and these, uh, so again, I talked a little bit about this um, at, in, at Spheric, but these kind of ideas actually seem to work quite well in practice. 
So just in summary then, you know, the problem was, well, we've got a set of differential equations and we want to discretize them. Well, we've got a sort of bunch of lessons that I hope are useful to you. Um, and the sixth lesson, I was going to go with nine lessons and think about carols because it's nearly Christmas time, but nine was too many, so I've gone with six. But basically this density sum is really fundamental and I found it really useful to think about that in other contexts as well. But it's really is the fundamental bridge between the discrete and the continuum in SVH. The Lagrangian really helped is what helps us satisfy the conservation laws and it tells us like what to do um, with some caveats. Um, so particle noise is a really good heuristic for an SPH calculation done badly or going wrong. And you should use it. We can ensure stability, especially for dissipative terms by making sure that you know, these terms give us positive definite entropy. And it's a really bad idea to think about particles as real. Um, instead, the right way to think about it is to think about that continuum and that bridge and think about um, partial differential equations um, and you know, think, use the Lagrangian to help guide us about how to discretize those things. And the wisdom from other methods um, is another way of just saying that the underlying problems that we have in all numerical schemes are, are usually common. Namely, that they're, they're a problem with you know, discretizing something which is continuous. And so it's not really always particularly fundamental to SPH or, or finite element or finite volume. Um, you know, each has their own little quirk, but often the deep underlying things when you think about them deeply are really just common issues. So if you don't like dot points and you prefer it all in capital shouting, so here it all is in shouting, density sum is really the fundamental thing, conservation range supreme, errors go into the particle distribution, entropy must increase, and particles are not real. It's fake news from the lamestream media. Thank you in a very muted audience. All right, thank you very much, Daniel. I I was very surprised to learn that Donald Trump has this much experience with uh, numerical <laughs> methods and SPH. I must have missed some of his tweets. Uh, but yeah, wonderful presentation. And we have some time for questions now, about 10 minutes. So we're going to welcome questions. Um, you can unmute yourself or just post in the chat. I'm going to read out the questions if you do that. <laughs> 